Hey everyone, One Piece Chapter 1114 is here, and you know what that means. It's time to talk about its paneling, composition, visual storytelling, and all of that business. This chapter had a wide range between action paneling, symbolic iconography, and subtle compositional tricks to hammer in the danger of what was revealed in the last chapter. Just One Piece being One Piece, you know. I'm excited to talk about this one, so let's get right into it. Last chapter ended by telling us the world is sinking. The ocean has always been a danger in One Piece. You need a navigator, a chef, a shipwright, a musician, and more to survive it. But now both the threat level and the ocean level are rising, so how do we represent that visually? Well, as the chapter jumps from island to island, it frames the ocean in two specific ways. With dark shading that makes it feel more dangerous, and with warped perspective that lets the sea curve upward. Oda uses this trick a lot to add drama to his shots, but in context of the reveal, it's making it feel like the ocean is about to engulf these islands. Since, you know, it's gonna do that. Although Egghead itself has been framed this way a lot lately, compare this to the flat ocean we got in shots of other islands from the prior few chapters. It's clear that this chapter wants the ocean to feel more imposing than usual. There's a neat progression of which islands we jump to. We start at Navy HQ, at the top of the world in some sense, and then go to islands like Mocktown and Water 7, then to Impel Down underwater before jumping to Fishman Island at the bottom of the world. The chapter itself sank deeper and deeper down just as the world is going to, of course, there's some great action paneling to talk about too. The page of the Straw Hats defending against Saturn follows up on the last chapter, using the same positional dynamic that was established then, all of them along a battle line, facing Saturn, to make the action clear in spite of having so many characters in the panel. The eye is directed along everything important, traveling from the speech bubbles along Nami's attack in Brook before reaching Saturn's attack, which then pulls the eye down toward Robin and the next panel. Darker elements are placed carefully to draw the eye along the same path with contrast as well. The next panel is the Straw Hats being caught in the net of Robin's arms, and I think there's a neat congruence in how even though we don't need a panel of the Straw Hats moving, we get a feeling of them flying backward toward that net because the arrangement of the panels and the flow of the eye. I also like the shape language you see in how Chopper can defend against Saturn because he's around Fuzzball, that compresses rather than break when he's under attack. Lucky for the Straw Hats, Saturn breaks away to search for the Mother Flame instead. This page is built around using circles in its composition, in order to direct the eye to the center and emphasize the flame itself. It makes something so small still feel like it has a grand effect. The contrast between the darker upper half and the brighter lower half draws the eye down and makes sure that Saturn stands out at the bottom. Oda has only given us three panels of the Mother Flame, and yet it's already a distinct shape that we're going to remember. Important story elements get unique visual iconography in a story as visual as One Piece. But my favorite example in the chapter of how visual One Piece is comes a few pages later, when Edison extends the clouds so that Sunny can reach the water. It goes beyond just making One Piece a visual story. It's a physical, tangible story. Powers, magic, and all the fantastical elements of One Piece aren't just there for fights, with the plot in between just being a bunch of talking to get us to those fights. The obstacles the characters face and the means they use to solve them are fantastical in physical ways and tie into the nature of the island that they're on. For me, that is the peak of what fantasy world building should be. We finish the chapter on another combat page, and some of you might be thinking, Worb, this attack goes from left to right. Don't you usually say that attacks in this series should go from right to left in order to feel powerful? And to that I say, is this attack supposed to feel powerful? Just like two chapters ago, it left Luffy's hand burning in comical pain. I think it's fine for an attack like that to not have its power emphasized. There's a nuance to how Luffy's attack isn't doing much, but he's still in control of the fight. We convey the latter point by having him still control most of the space of the panel, pushing Warkiri back and compressing him like a spring. The circles in the composition draw the eye to Luffy and convey a feeling of energy bursting outward. And the contrast draws the eye along, with how Warkiri is black and grey, Luffy's fist is black and white, and Luffy himself is mostly shaded white. I like the note the chapter ends on, with Vegapunk's serious and thoughtful expression right next to Luffy's absurd one. Yet the thing that's making Vegapunk act so ponderous is itself, indirectly, Luffy. The fact that something so silly is so important is at the core of what One Piece is about right now. Something big is coming next week. Something I've been working on for a long time and I think you all are really gonna like. Make sure you don't miss it by subscribing and follow me on Twitter or Blue Sky for updates on it. There's actually a small preview available for patrons and channel members, so you know what to do if you want to see that. 
You can also get your name up on the screen here and access to full extended thoughts on the paneling of the chapters I cover. Also, like and comment, I guess. Thanks, see ya.